Welcome to the theater. Take a seat, grab some popcorn, and get ready for another horror movie double bill. This is Friday Night Fratricide. Good evening, good evening. Come on in and sit down. Join us for another episode of Friday Night Fratricide. I really don't know why I just did that with my hands. Woo! It's not like anyone can see me. Stretch about. <laughs> I'm just performing. We're doing away. Yeah. <laughs> It's been a couple of weeks. I've forgotten how to do this. Yeah. I've not been, not been recording for a while. Recorded. You've been away on holiday. I have been away on holiday. Did you have a nice holiday? I did. I had a great holiday. Good. Thank you very much. Good. We listened to very loud music. Yeah. Yeah, it was very hot. <laughs> <laughs> I am Fraser. And I am Ewan. And we are the Happy Brothers, here with you to, to talk about more horror films. That's right. That's right. We have another exciting double bill. Mm-hmm. Um, a bit of a niche theme this week i would say yeah one that you came up with i yeah. will just put out I there didn't, i didn't make up the concept well, you didn't make up the, like, the genre the, there are people will use the term but it's not a it's not a uh, super common term it's yes proto slashers proto slashers indeed so basically um, the the original yeah slashers sort of predating things like friday the 13th and halloween and all those more generic mm. generic i guess yeah it, yeah slashers before slashers were a thing yeah you know they paved way they paved way yeah, yeah for for the proper very well put films. yeah so we have peeping tom peeping tom which is widely regarded as sort of the first a lot of people would say it's slasher the first. film I'm pretty sure there's a line in one of the Scream films where they say something. It's like the, you know, there's the whole yeah. thing where the ghost face asks trivia. I think trivia, that's the, actually the first trivia. start of the first one with uh, Drew Barrymore. It could be. It kind of asks the horror trivia and, and is like, oh, you got it wrong. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And the question is like, what was the first slasher film? And it's like a trick question because one of the options that he didn't give the option of Peeping Tom, but he says that Peeping Tom was the first one. Oh, maybe. I think, I don't remember. I think, no, I think she gets it right could be Maybe. i can't yeah you're right it is definitely know, one the, of them yeah. yeah um so yeah we have peeping tom and psycho hmm. the original alfred hitchcock psycho both 1960 which both i didn't realize yeah i thought peeping tom was 59 because i knew it came out just before psycho but right. i thought it was like the previous year right but it was just like earlier the same earlier year. in the same year yeah both um interesting films mm-hmm. interesting watches i watched them both this morning yeah so they're both fresh <laughs> in my mind um i did i am just back from holiday so yeah, I, yeah, I didn't have a huge amount of time to spread them out unfortunately so if i do get any details mixed up between the two of them please keep me right would you like to start with peeping tom since yeah that's the first do you one want me to start with peeping tom yeah right, take we'll us away peeping tom so peeping tom came out in 1960 it was made in britain um made in, in england somewhere Directed by Michael Powell, who was a a bit of a mainstay in British cinema at the time, but it, like he had done, there was a film called The Red Shoes, was like his probably his most famous film okay. at this point. Um, but this film completely tanked his career. He could not get any more work after this because it everyone perceived it as being totally perverted and totally sick and horrible mm-hmm. and like now we look back at it and it's like it's pretty tame oh, by yeah. horror standards oh, yeah. there's like barely any blood in it there's there's no nudity nope even for a film that's about voyeurism mm-hmm. there's there's not really it's about like voyeurism and murder and there's basically no gore there's no nudity there's no nothing um but i think just the concepts that they were exploring are were viewed as being totally taboo at the time pretty dark i mean for 1960 it's, it is pretty dark yeah um yeah so we've got um carl bohm who is a german actor playing the main character mark lewis who is a film fanatic he works on a film set as a focus puller which is one of those sort of little known um rules on a film set he would like manually set the the focus of the camera and adjust it as the camera moves oh, that I didn't was kind of his, what, that's what a focus puller does that's it's, cool. it's a lot of people will credit it as one of those totally underappreciated uh roles because like these super famous shots like 
we're just talking about it because we we're talking about shark movies the yeah. the scene in jaws where it's like the, the dolly zoom yeah, yeah, and yeah. all of that like that you couldn't do that unless you had someone just manually operating the focus sure and stuff like that you know so it's one of those really kind of underappreciated jobs but that's what he does he's a focus puller yeah. he wants to be a director and also he is obsessed with he's, he's a bit he's a voyeur he but we don't want to see much of it but he's yeah he's not really he isn't they kind of talk about how he, he likes watching women through windows and he has this weird obsession with photographing women and um he has a night job where he takes naked pictures uh, that yeah. are sold under the counter in this news sort agent pin-up photos yeah like pin-up photos um and he as the film kicks off the the first scene that we that we get of him is we're seeing this he films himself murdering women he mm -hmm. he goes around and he murders them and we just, like it's these pov shots of women getting murdered is what he creates mm -hmm. for his art that's his thing and we realize that he's a bit of a you know strange twisted individual um and that's you know that's the premise of the film that's like yeah. a lot of where the where the film goes from there it kind of um, kicks off immediately doesn't it like yeah. the very first shot is him he's filming a, a prostitute mm -hmm. and she kind of comes up to him and says like five dollars for the night or whatever five yeah. pounds for the night sorry it's yeah, British. Yeah. um and then he follows her it's all pov and then he murders her in her bed yeah um which yeah i was a bit I don't know. I don't know what I expected, but it just kind of kicked straight off and went it right does, into it. It really, which jumps, was it really jumps right into good. it, um, which I liked. It's one of the big differences between it and something like Psycho, which we'll be getting to shortly. Yeah. Psycho has a lot more build-up. You're talking like half an hour, 40 minutes yeah. before it, of build-up before it gets to the big scene, the big, very famous first murder in the film. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this, it's like, yeah, it jumps right in. He's just he's filming this woman he's talking to her he's basically not saying anything to her she's just immediately like yeah this is how much it'll cost you we'll go my flat's right over there we're gonna go get down to business she goes in and then he just he kills her yeah. and it's yeah um i really like the the opening scene for a couple of reasons there's a i, I don't know maybe this is just a coincidence and i'm reading too much into it but there's a scene where he has a he has a box of film that he's obviously just loaded his camera up with and as he's walking to the flat and following this woman he chucks it in the bin and we see it and it looks to me i thought it looked just like a box of condoms i thought that as well and I, yeah okay cool it's not just me no no i thought that as well i don't know if that was an intentional thing or if it's like that's just what film boxes looked like and it's just a coincidence but i saw it and i thought that's a sort of an interesting visual uh-huh like that little comparison and then the next day like after this murder's happened we see outside the flat the police are there there's a bunch of sort of punters outside watching as the body's getting taken away and um this is the first time that we really see mark the main character he's standing with his camera and he's filming the police taking the body away and they immediately assume that he's press mm -hmm. as you would and one of the one of the the rosers comes up to him and says like you see oh, Rosers. One of the Rosers, yeah. Comes up to him and is like, Oh, are you are you with the with the papers? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, sure, why not? And they say which one? And he goes, Oh, the observer. I thought that was a really clever line. I yeah. really like I heard that and I was just like, Oh, that's such a good like he is the observer. He he's is a peeping the Tom. Observer. It's great, it's very clever. Um yeah, I like that. And like I think just that they really kind of set the the tone for me, like really enjoying this film not to spoil my opinion of it but like i just even just the first few minutes like stylistically it was really interesting there's a couple of these little like the two little details that i've mentioned i just loved jumping right in with that mm -hmm. um i thought it was really interesting yeah um i liked i liked a lot about the film um the i'm never i'm trying to word this properly when we have a film like this where it's very much an anti-hero anti-villain which which one is this i guess an anti-villain anti-villain he's doing bad things but not necessarily for bad reasons yeah sort of i guess does that make no would that make him an anti-hero i'm not I sure know. he's the protagonist but he's definitely a bad person yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and i never really know how to feel when we have a character like that who is a bit sympathetic yeah, because we learn as the film goes on 
that he was abused as a child Mm -hmm. and his father abused his mother and him and filmed it all and he was a peeping tom as well yeah presumably did it to other people as well i don't know um but very much was abusive towards his his wife and his son yeah and kind of forced him to be like his father Mm -hmm. and that's why he's got all these deep-seated issues and why he films women and murders them and everything yeah and i i don't know i I always feel very conflicted when a film does this because what he's doing is so horrific to make it sympathetic never quite sits right with me yeah i'm kind of like i don't i don't really feel sorry for this guy i get that so that whole aspect of the film is kind of lost on me because Mm -hmm. He, he is a horrible person uh, like yeah yeah no Just... I, I can see that like from the get-go we know that he's a murderer that's mm-hmm. our first impression yeah, of yeah, him yeah. is that he is a murderer so it is weird you're not rooting for him you're just following him and kind of seeing what he does yeah um which was probably one of the things that made it so controversial at the time is that he was not a clear-cut hero or villain. Yeah. He is, like, you're you're following him. He's the main character. You're not necessarily made to root for him, but at the same time, you're not meant to hate him in the way that you would be meant to hate a villain. I mean, I don't know how many films or TV shows or anything at the time really did that style where you focus. Probably I mean, I'm not thinking many like, Nowadays, all. you've got, you know, things like The Sopranos or Breaking Bad. Yeah where it's very much you are focused the the protagonist is a bad person yeah and you're supposed to root for them mm-hmm. or well arguably yeah. you know what yeah, i mean yeah. like they, they are very much the focus of the story yeah and that's become quite prominent in, oh yeah in more definitely. recent years yeah blurring the line between like hero and villain is so much more common now yeah to the point where people get annoyed if you do it too it's, much. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's reached the point now where we want to just go back to like oh can we please just have a villain that doesn't have a tragic backstory yeah. you know yeah whereas at the time the idea of trying to create sympathy for a villain at all was horrendous yeah villains in films were they were witches or they were nazis Evil. and those were basically the two mustache options. twirling yeah <laughs> um yeah so it is a really interesting seeing it in that way and i think psycho also has a bit of that so obviously it, we'll get to it but a little bit yeah um yeah so we've we've gotten this first scene we've gotten the the, the first murder the next thing we really see of carl he's back at his house well it's a I guess has been converted into flats and there's a young woman on the ground floor who's having a party she's just turned 21 um, 21 21 not 21 not 21 not at all <laughs> no disrespect um, to her but she's no. not 21 <laughs> um and he he goes in they, they kind of they interact they hadn't met before and she's like oh come and join the party and he's like no i don't like parties i don't want to join the party yeah. um and he sort of goes up by him st- by himself upstairs she then goes up and joins him and they start talking they're kind of chatting and flirting and she's like oh what do you do what it's so interesting you make films show me one of your films and then he starts showing her this is when we get all of his backstory he starts showing her like oh yeah my father used to film me when i was a child and he used to film me 24 7 and he used to try and terrify me because he was a biologist who specialize on the study of fear and it's like oh boy yeah and it's like the it's not this bit it's later on that we get the thing of he's like the whole house is wired for sound Mm -hmm. and he turns on all of the there's like recordings of him as a kid and he's just screaming Mm -hmm. and it's like him at different ages screaming at the same time it's it's pretty, pretty upsetting it's a lot yeah um but yeah one of the kind of interesting i guess sort of I don't know if you'd call it a meta element to the film or maybe not intentionally at least but one of the things that sort of blurs between the reality and the fiction is that um the actors playing mark as a child and his father are um the director uh i wrote it down and then i i've forgotten what was the director's name again uh, michael powell michael powell and his son whose name i have forgotten um they're playing like mark's dad and mark as a child all right okay um and it is kind of funny because a lot of people i think probably because of the context of the film of like mark is totally traumatized because his dad used to shove a camera in his face when he was a kid now 
the director was putting his child in front of camera and then the audience like lots of people in the audience were really upset by that they started freaking out like you're abusing your child you're exploiting him you're putting him on on camera when he doesn't want to be on camera this is abuse it's terrible and now there are so many interviews with um michael powell's son just saying like it it was fine it was a film i was there it was me my dad was making a film and he was like hey do you want to be in it and i was like yeah sure whatever (laughs) and it's like the mark's mother is also played by the uh, michael powell's i don't know if it was his wife his partner who is the mm-hmm. mother of his son um yeah but like there are lots of people now or at least at the time it now it is known that a lot of people at the time were kind of freaked out by that that they they I guess sort of just blurred the reality yeah i guess the just the content that. of the film you i can see why they would draw that conclusion yeah um and i guess at the time as well they didn't have the same like sort of safety standards shooting films as I they guess, do now i guess yeah especially for kids and younger younger folk mm-hmm. so I, I, yeah it is funny but i can kind of see yeah. why they would yeah. draw yeah, that yeah, conclusion yeah. i think a lot of people probably just jump to it because of the like the content of the film yeah not necessarily yeah, just yeah. the idea of having a child on film in general yeah um but yeah at this point there's a really good shot she's the um God, I'm terrible with names. I've got the Wikipedia article open because it was last week that I watched the film, and I'm just going through. Oh, I can't, I can't even remember. I watched it earlier today. Characters, and I can't remember her names. Um, Helen, the young woman. Oh, that yes, he's, yes, that yes. he's showing the film to. She's at this point getting quite upset seeing this footage of him sort of screaming and crying as a kid, and there's a the shot when it cuts to mark sort of standing and he's it's like the old old school film projector it's got these big film reels and he stood and you can just kind of see his eyes through the film reels Mm -hmm. um and i really liked that i thought that was a really cool shot um and he gets a camera out and he starts filming her to get her reaction of watching the film yeah and it's all of this sort of it's a film we're watching someone watching a film and they're being filmed to get their reaction of watching a film and all of that kind of starts to starts to come into it i thought the direction of this film it really stood out to me yeah out of all the things it was really really well shot stylistically um, it's it's gorgeous it's a really lovely looking film when you when you cut it together with like the pov shots mm-hmm. and a lot of like the big shots the use of color it, it's yeah i don't know if there's anything thematic like peak technicolor this yeah, is, yeah yeah i don't know if there was anything sort of behind the choice of colors that they used but there were certain mm-hmm. shots the shot where he's he stays behind at the film studio at night and shoots with the stunt double. Yep. It's just gorgeously lit. It's like sort of very pink and, and uh, bright colors, but then the back of the stage where he's filming is very dark and shadowy. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's really gorgeous. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, it really, really stood out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Helen gets kind of upset and leaves. And that's pretty much the end of that scene. Yeah. Mark has sort of freaked her out a little bit. They've clearly made some sort of connection. She's very curious about him more than anything else. But they they seem to have... Yeah. She's she's not very happy that she was being shown quite such disturbing stuff. Um, Then we move on. The next day, Mark is at work. He's doing his whole thing on the film set. Um, We get a little bit of context of the director being a little bit of an arsehole and the actress in the film isn't particularly good there's sort of there's lots of things giving the impression that the film isn't very good Mm -hmm. like it's not going to be a very good film it's kind of lowbrow it's a bit of a sort of silly comedy kind of film i think you get the impression that michael powell sort of looks down on films like that you know for better or for worse whether you agree with him or not he certainly (laughs) seems to look down on films like that um and mark gets invited out uh for a drink by one of the other cast member one of the other uh crew members and he kind of says like oh no i'm busy i can't whatever and sort of makes eye contact with this woman that's also on set we don't really know what's going on turns out this other woman um vivian who is the stand-in for the main actress standard standard well yeah yeah, stand-in so she's standing to get the all of the lighting yeah yeah. whatever all of that um the two of them are going to stay they're going to hide in the set and they're going to wait until everyone else goes home and they're going to come out and they're going to film some well vivian thinks she's going to be shooting for a film mark of course he's shooting for his own personal mm-hmm. private project and is planning on killing her 
and we get this great scene where he's going around he's setting up all the lights and she's kind of she's dancing in the room she's talking about how she dreams of being an actress and she's going to be the next big thing and he's running around and he's setting the cameras up and he's setting the lighting up and there's a shot of him kind of from below he's up on the rigging with all these cameras shining down and we sort of just see him in silhouette and um it's really cool and it made me think of um that bit in singing in the rain this can't have been that long after singing the rain. was that early 50s 53 53? so this wasn't that long after singing in the rain um there's the scene where they have the the big romantic moment and he, they're on the film set and he's yeah. going around and he's like oh i'm gonna turn the fans on and put the like make a big sunset and whatever um and it kind of made me think of that and i was like oh this is like it's like singing in the rain meets american psycho <laughs> it's it's it's, it's that's, a, that's just a good way of putting but it. like yeah, visually yeah. and stylistically and with all the color and the music it's very much like that sort of era yeah. of these very romantic traditional films but then it's got all this murder and all this sleaze in it yeah. and it it that juxtaposition really shines through in this scene and it works so well there was one thing i noticed actually so there's uh at his night job when he's shooting the pinup there's a scene mm. earlier on and he's shooting um th- there's one girl i can't remember her name and then there's another girl sort of stood at the back of the room and it's her first time getting photoed and when she finally turns around and faces the camera she's got a bad bruise or sort of defect on her upper lip Mm -hmm. and uh, mark is very taken by that he's very like attracted to sort of the uniqueness of her features and as he starts to film her and photograph her it's really really like romantic music playing it's not like sinister it's not weird it's very romantic Mm -hmm. and it's just weird how that or well it's very clever actually how it plays into the whole he doesn't believe he's doing anything wrong. It's all for him. It's all very, he's paying tribute to his victims kind of thing. Yeah. And I really like that, that aspect of it as well. Yeah. This, this idea of in his head, it's all romanticism. It's all. Yeah. Very. um, Yeah. I think they do a good job there with like blurring the lines between like the violence and the romance. And yeah, it's interesting. Um, so that yeah, we go through this big whole scene. It's it's weirdly romantic. He then murders Vivian. Yeah. Um sticks her in a box. He sticks her in a box, sticks her in like a it's like a luggage like a tr- a trunk. Like yeah. A, um big big suitcase. That is part of the it's like a prop on the film. Then the next day they're filming, they're going through the, the process they're doing a scene when the main character is like picking out a bit of luggage and she's like opening the suitcases one by one and mark realizes they're going to open the suitcase with the body in it so he goes out he gets the camera so that he can film uh the the main actress uh diane film her reaction Mm -hmm. to finding the body um yeah it's kind of creepy he like sort of lurks and films her and yeah it's interesting um and then it kind of kicks off this thing with like the police are there. There's there's two characters that are introduced that are like cops. Yeah, it doesn't they're not particularly important to the plot, but we get a bit no. of a focus on them at this point. They also don't seem overly professional. They're all like making jokes and yeah, they're like yeah, one, about. one of them's one of them's making making jokes during the time when they're investigating the crime scene. Mark sneaks up onto the rafters and is sort of looking down on them mm-hmm. and um, drops something. He's got like pens in his in his breast pocket and they fall out and they hit the floor and it alerts the police and it's a very very tense scene it's really well done but then the police are they're alerted that there's a noise and they just kind of go that was weird anyway back to loudly talking about this murder and how we definitely don't suspect the creepy german guy who films everything (laughs) um yeah he like he goes and he gets interviewed he goes and talks with them and they're like why do you have a camera and he's like i'm making a documentary and they're just like all right then (laughs) continue filming (laughs) all these police interviews i I guess um but then they do wind up actually suspecting him and they they start tailing him and that's Mm -hmm. how the, the kind of final act of the film kicks off but at this point they know that the woman that's murdered at the beginning of the film i'm just gonna double check her name dora and Vivian, they know that the two murders are connected because both women were found with this look of sheer terror on their faces. Mm-hmm. That that like the cops even say, "I've seen people who have been murdered. I know what 
like fear of i am going to be killed looks like this is not that this is beyond that there is something that they are seeing while they die that is terrifying them more than just the fear of death itself mm-hmm. um and we see i think we've seen it both times or maybe it's just in the first murder that there's like a light sort of shining on dora's face right before she dies when she starts screaming and shouting as she realizes she's about to die there's kind of a light sort of glinting on her face and then we see it as well in the footage of mark as a child when he's getting woken up and he's really disturbed at the fact that he's mm-hmm. been woken up we see this light shining on his face we don't know what it is um and i think we might get that with vivian as well i can't really remember but anyway we've seen that at this point and then we get to this final act where the police are starting to tail mark he goes to the news agent mm-hmm. where he works where he shadows and does the the pin up photography upstairs and he's dragged in the uh the model that he was with earlier in the film and murders her as well Mm -hmm. and then leaves by himself and he realizes that he's being followed by the police he heads heads home and we get the confrontation with uh with helen helen kind of at this point starts to realize what's going on and he confesses to the murders to her And they have this weird intimacy where Helen isn't... She's upset that he's murdering people, but she is kind of defensive of him, Mm -hmm. and they're still very close. And he he realizes that the police are coming, they're going to come and arrest him, and then the finale of this film, he sets up the camera with the tripod jutting out, which is what he's been using as a murder weapon. He's got one of the tripod legs has a spike in it, Mm -hmm. and he sticks it up and and prepares to kill himself um no this is sorry that's after he he starts filming helen and kind of walks her through the whole process and at this point we get the reveal that when he kills people he has a mirror mounted on the front of the camera that he shines in their faces Mm -hmm. because the last thing that they see before they die is the look of fear on their own face and he kind of says like the most terrifying thing in the world is fear or whatever the line is. I can't remember. I'm totally butchering. This this totally influential and very famous line in the film. He's kind of, he says like, do you know what the most horrifying thing in the world is? It's fear or something like that. Um, And then, yeah, at this point, the police are breaking in. He has the camera set up. He has a bunch of cameras set up around the room to take photos uh, on command, just automatically. Mm -hmm. And then he, as the police are breaking in, he runs into the spike and stabs himself in the throat. And he films himself dying. The blood spurts and out all over the wall. And... Blood sprays on the wall, and and then he collapses on the ground. And Helen's crying over him, and the police come in, and that's the end of the film. Yeah, and it's yeah, a bit of a grim ending, but it's... also weirdly, I get I'm not okay. Yeah, romantic isn't the word, but it's weirdly. I, I would no, I think romantic senti- is sentimental. The word. I sort sort well, of yeah, it's like he he's he's ready to die he's happy to die in that way where he's terrified because he's experiencing that for the last time and this is the perfect end to these fil this film that he's been making where he's been capturing people being terrified right before their death the best way to end is with himself terrified right before he dies yeah um yeah we kind of glossed over uh this sort of plot with him and helen yeah when they go out uh they they do there there is sort of a bit of a a bit of a point where they go out on a date Mm -hmm. and she he's kind of opening up to her a bit and he does stop a couple of times in the street on their date to to peep at people yeah (laughs) um and she is almost understanding she kind of she doesn't want him to she kind of ushers him away but kind of sees that he obviously does have issues and accepts that yeah so it's not yeah at the end it's not uh completely unexpected that she does kind of feel for him and understand yeah what's going on even if she doesn't agree with him murdering people um yeah yeah it's fun mm-hmm. <laughs> there was also sorry another thing that i totally glossed over because i forgot about it the um i think it's earlier the the same day that all of this stuff happens at the very end of the film while mark is at work this is clearly the first day that they've resumed filming after vivian was found dead mm-hmm. And um, Diane, the actress, is, like, very stressed out, very uncomfortable after she has found this body. She's, like, 
needing to be eased back into it and everyone's being very gentle and delicate with her and there's a psychiatrist on set that mark then goes and talks to and kind of says like oh well you you did you know my father he this is such and such and he was an expert on fear and all of this and he starts talking about this compulsion to be a peeping tom and to to stare at people and be a voyeur and um this psychiatrist starts talking about he calls it scoptophilia Mm -hmm. which is the technical term um it doesn't it it doesn't really go anywhere i guess it just gives a little bit of context for what's going on with mark being a bit of a loony i think it kind of shows that he is a bit self-aware as well yeah he is aware of what he is and yeah he kind of asks for help as well Mm -hmm. he says like what what can you do to cure this can it be cured yeah and he, the, the psychiatrist says, like, oh, you need, like, three years of intense therapy. Yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, it's really easy to cure. It's super quick. Like, you know, three years of therapy and yeah. you're fine. You're golden, <laughs> man. It's fine. Um, which, of course, Mark didn't really want to hear. I think it, no. that that's kind of the point where he, he leaves and he goes off and he's like, I'm just going to I'm gonna kill the model and then I'm just going to go home and kill myself. Yeah. Um, like, I can't be cured. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. Apologies. There were a couple of things. There's also a whole thing with um, yes. Helen's mother who's blind yeah and he kind of she, she kind of catches him or or he hears him doing something yeah in the room above and asks him what's on the film and what's going on but obviously he can't kill her because she can't see her own reflection mm-hmm. so yeah it'd be pointless yeah and there's the yeah there's kind of an interesting shot she's going around and she's like sort of begging to know what the film is because mm-hmm. she's concerned for her daughter's well-being and you're seeing this footage that's being projected on the wall of the woman i think it's vivian's murder and he's kind of like that's no, nothing it's fine well don't he's worry. not he's he's don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> being very very suspicious yeah. but um and he's 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 clearly got a lot of sort of turmoil going on he's really tortured um with this which is yeah it's complicated the whole thing of are you supposed to sympathize with the I know, character I know. or not? Yeah, I know. Because he's a murderer. He's a terrible person. But yeah. Cool. How hmm. did you rank it? How did I rank how, it? How, going, your... how long have we been recording for? Or oh, we've been recording long enough that we can just go jump right into the ranking. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm, oh, give, give me your thoughts and then yeah. give me your ranking. Okay, yeah. I really liked it. It was um, visually really, really good. I thought it was a really interesting concept. It felt to me very Italian, to be totally honest. It was a wee bit sort of giallo I think it's got a lot of giallo going on. Yeah. Um, but as much as this is a proto-slasher, and this was before slashers were a thing, yeah. it's also kind of before giallo really came into its own as well. Yeah, yeah. This, a is, quite, uh, this is clearly must have been a very influential film, even oh, if it totally absolutely. destroyed the career of the, uh, of the director and... There wasn't really anything else like it, at least for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, it was clearly very influential, just with its with its style and with its tone and kind of the themes that it was exploring. Um, I think, unfortunately, the plot feels a little bit unfocused in places. I think it it jumps around a little bit. I think some of the stuff probably could have done with being cut out and had them focus on. Maybe if we had gotten a little bit more depth into Helen's relationship with Mark, maybe if we had gotten just a little bit more of Mark, honestly, if we had gotten more of Mark's kind of voyeuristic tendencies, because we don't really get that much. Yeah, there's not a huge amount. There are a few times where they kind of spell it out to the audience that he's a bit of a creep, but we don't really see an awful lot of it. I think if they had taken time to have some really kind of slow, tense scenes of him creeping around places and then cut out maybe a little bit of the guff with like helen's mum. <laughs> yeah yeah i think would have would have it would have benefited a little bit there and to be honest i wasn't a big fan of the music i think in places it was quite good but there's quite a lot of um solo piano they did for the soundtrack yeah which gives it a real sort of silent film vibe to me i don't know if that's just me that that saw it that way but some of the the soundtrack really made me think of sort of silent film music oh, yeah. that kind of not not quite ragtime but very yeah kind of i know what you plinky mean. plonky solo piano I, and I, I thought that detracted from a little bit i didn't really get that but i do agree the music wasn't fantastic mm-hmm. it was it, it it was fine yeah but it felt a little bit out of place at points the stuff with the the, the romantic style music playing with mark and his his victims mm-hmm. i liked what they did with it but outside of that 
the music wasn't really anything special. It wasn't yep. anything notable. And I think, yeah, you easily could have done something with that. The one film I always get Peeping Tom mixed up with is Twisted Nerve. Yeah. Which is not a film I've seen, mm-hmm. but I know it's a sort of similar-ish premise. Yeah. That I think sort of... of a guy stalking people, and mm-hmm. he, it, there's a very... You'll know the tune, the you'll whistling know. tune. Because it was used in... Kill Bill, it's Kill Bill, and also in American Horror American Story. American Horror Story as well, yeah. Um, you'll, you'll know the tune. It was Bernard Herrmann. Yes, it was, yeah. Who, very Herman. interestingly, we're going to be talking about we in will about be. 10 yes, minutes. absolutely. I love Bernard Herrmann. He's maybe yeah. one of my favourite film, com- probably my favourite film composer ever. I love Bernard Herrmann. But the fact that you know the music from this film, yeah. from Twisted Nerve, and I couldn't tell you anything about the film, yeah. really, other than the music and sort of what it signifies. Yeah shows how much music can influence a good film like this so if they'd had something like that here yeah i think it really would have boosted it yeah even to be honest i'm not i don't want to criticize the music for being too sort of goofy i know i'm saying that i didn't much like how it kind of had that sort of silent film yeah. vibe but excuse me it kind of reminded me of another film that came out it must have been around the same time also has a very european feel to it because it was french is uh, eyes without a face i don't know if you've seen eyes without a face i know the name you might need to it, it's the one it's like a memory. it's like a doctor whose daughter ha- she's got some debilitating disease i can't really remember it particularly well i watched it about a year ago okay. and her face is um she needs to cover her face up for whatever reason her face is sort of deteriorating okay and it's about this doctor who goes around and basically wants to kill women so that he can perform like a face transplant right onto his daughter and give her a new face okay um but the main theme for that like the opening is really weirdly like upbeat and kind of (laughs) silly the music almost but it's a lot more iconic i think i think peeping tom doesn't have as much as i don't like that peeping tom was too goofy i think it still could have been good while just be still being as goofy yeah if it had been a bit better yeah also there wasn't like i couldn't if you could play if you played me the music for this film i yeah. wouldn't be able to tell you yeah probably that it was not. from this film like, like if you just played it randomly i wouldn't be able to know what it was from there was nothing really notable about it yeah sadly yeah um yeah so ups and downs i think one thing that that sean is is um carl bohm as mark as the main character yeah I th- I thought he was really good. Okay. I thought he came across as very like he he really towed the line between that level of like he's so creepy, but also you can't you can't not feel a little bit of sympathy for him. Mm. He's clearly such a kind of tortured and weird character that you just you want to like you want to put a blanket around him and tell him that everything's going to be okay. And then before he's, he stabs and you, and before he stabs you, <laughs> before he kills you, um, yeah. And I really, I, I really liked him. I thought he was really good. Yeah. And I really like um, Carl Bohm. He, I think he's still kicking. He might not be. I, I don't know. But in later in his life, he dedicated a lot of his time and effort into like humanitarian work. Oh. He's done a lot of charity work, which is really cool. Good, good, good for Carl. Good for him. Um, yeah. What? So. No, sorry, yeah, I was gonna really say, good. what did you rank it? I gave it a four out of five. Four out of five. Because okay. I thought it was, I thought it was very impressive. I can see why it is I, as iconic as it is. Yeah, it's not without its faults. There are things about it that I would change, but overall, I thought it was a very impressive film. And I would, yeah. I think it's one of those. A lot of people will say that it's like a must watch for horror fans, and I would definitely agree. This yeah. is one of those like you really got to just give it a go because it's so formative for Mm -hmm. horror this was like influenced so much yeah i'm not miles away Mm -hmm. from from what you said um yeah i i I loved a lot about the film but i did have probably a wee bit more of an issue with it um i i think i I kind of echo your sentiments on the plot and the pacing of the film Mm -hmm. a little bit it's it's like a one hour 40 minute film so it's airing on the long side for the time quite long um i think you could easily cut that down to like you know an 80 85 minute film and cut out a bit of bit of guff um i wasn't a huge fan of the acting i have to say i I think carol didn't do a bad job 
mm-hmm. but I have seen others do that kind of similar character, that kind of tortured killer better. Yeah. Um, and I just there was there was moments where I was like, ah, his his whole ooh, I'm a bit creepy shtick was yeah. a bit like, ah, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and other than him, I wouldn't say there was any real standouts in terms of the other actors. Yeah. I liked, was it Vivian? The the, the, stand-in. the stand-in, yeah. I thought she was pretty good in the short screen time that she had. Yeah. Her sort of little dance and her, you know, speech about aspiring to be an actor and mm-hmm. talking with, with Mark about, being filmed and all that i thought she was good in that but then she gets killed off um, yeah and there wasn't really anyone else helen's mother was all right yeah but yeah um but the positives i mean it was beautifully directed i thought it was really really unique in a lot of the shots and like especially when you consider it for its time how unique it was um and just the story as well that just the idea of following this sort of as much as i do question the the ethics of it but mm-hmm. like following a sympathetic serial killer yeah it's an interesting take and especially you know when you consider it for the time it was something new and something a bit different yeah um so yeah overall worth a watch didn't hate it at all had a few issues with it i gave it a three out of five three out of five three out of five peepings out with tom nice that's a good yeah. one yeah so i i yeah i did uh, you know what i did I'll, I'll admit i had it as a three mm-hmm. but as we were talking about it i was like no there is actually a lot more to like about this film than yeah. i think i initially kind of considered so what are you giving it, so giving I bumped it, three. it up three out of five three three, three and a half out of five three and a half out of five okay. yeah cool. i had it written down as a three yeah. earlier but you're going for a three but and as half. we were talking about i think it, it deserves i think a three a and a half is valid i think to be fair a three also would be valid yeah like, i think it it's one of those films that a lot of people now may well go back to and be kind of bored by Mm -hmm. unfortunately i personally think it's very impressive i found it very engaging yeah i thought it was pretty great it's it's pretty it's pretty good yeah it's worth the watch and yeah if you're a horror fan and you've not seen it it's definitely worth yeah going back and seeing kind of where all these slashers originated from what Mm. inspired a lot of them yeah this is one that I have had on my list for a long time to watch, yeah. and I'm really glad I watched it. Yeah. Good. Well, we shall move on to our next mm-hmm. movie in our double bill. Yep. We have, as we said, another slasher from 1960, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. His possibly most well-known film, arguably. Maybe. He's got so many that you would know a a drop of a hat that it's it's hard to say for sure. But definitely one of, if not the most iconic scene in horror, Mm -hmm. the shower scene. Yeah. If you've never even touched a horror film, you will know what this film is. You'll have seen it or you'll have seen a parody of it or something. You'll know the music as well. It's used everywhere. (laughs) Um, So yeah, we follow Marion crane Mm -hmm. as she plans to flee the state she's living in phoenix arizona as she plans to to run away she's been embezzling funds from uh from her boss she works as like a realtor yeah well she well she steals she steals a a fund she steals yeah she she hasn't been stealing over time yeah she she just suddenly decides she's gonna steal a a lump sum sorry um sorry I, this I, is probably one of those films that i'm going to be very specific about because okay. this is one of my favorite films okay I've that's fine so many times that's fine that's yeah. fine this was my first time watching it from start to finish mm. um so the i think i did i knew everything that happened i knew yeah, yeah, yeah. everything that went on but it was my first time actually sitting down and watching it all um so she's planning to run away with her um fiance partner sam mm-hmm. and they're planning to, to run away she goes ahead as she's leaving, she gets really paranoid. She sees her boss walk in the st- uh, when she's parked at a red light. He kind of walks across and smiles at her and doesn't really clock what's going on. And she drives off and then she gets stopped by the police officer as she's driving out of state. And she's like, oh no, I'm being followed and blah, blah, blah. She switches cars. She goes to a mechanic and s- sells her old car and switches it up with a new one with new plates so she can't be followed or whatever. And ends up spending the night at the Bates Motel. 
who stops and needs a place to stay, run by um, Norman Bates, mm -hmm. the eponymous Norman Bates. Yeah. Um, played by Anthony Perkins, who, by the way, is a gorgeous man. He's such a handsome man. I did not realise how attractive he was. I, he, I never really like sat down and thought about it. <laughs> basically, all he had been in before this point was these sort of like frilly summertime romantic films really? about like okay, yeah, I can see a it. girl falls in love with the boy next door yeah, yeah, yeah and the boy next door was always played by anthony perkins like that was his role he was this like young charming like your mom would love him kind of like nice young man yeah 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 um and he oh he's i really i love anthony perkins yeah. he's so good he was he's and great. you know what he's an incredible actor as he's well he's a fantastic actor he does a great job like this. see between him and janet lee mm -hmm. for the first half hour of this film i was like visibly impressed by how good the acting was for a film that came out in 1960 yeah not that they weren't good actors back then, but mm. just when you're watching horror films from the 1960s, you're kind of, it's very much hit or miss. You're not yeah. expecting to be blown away. But yeah. watching this, I was like, wow, holy shit. They're like top of their game. Mm -hmm. um, I think she got nominated for a, an Oscar for this, did she not? I'm not for sure. supporting actor. I um, don't know if she won or not. I don't think she did. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so she, she spent a night at, um, the hotel she kind of bonds a bit with norman they're chatting um and he's kind of asking what's going on and she's very apprehensive to tell him anything and then he we kind of get some weird shots of his mother shouting at him from outside and we don't ever see the mother and of course you know where this goes if you know yeah, about psycho yeah. but well, everyone's familiar I'll, with I'll, I'll try and that. not give it away until we get yeah. to that point in the film but yeah we hear his mother sort of shouting at him and arguing with him and then of course she goes and takes a shower we're about half half an hour into the film or so mm -hmm. she goes to take a shower mm -hmm. and we obviously at this point think that she's a protagonist and then norman bates mother or the silhouette of norman bates mother runs into the shower and of course stabs her to death in just i mean what what can I possibly say about this scene that hasn't already been said? The, like the most, probably the most it, iconic scene in horror films ever. Arguably, yes, it's, it's yeah, incredible. Absolutely. And it, every time you watch it, I, every time I watch it, at least I find something new to be impressed. Yeah, by. not a drop of blood. Not a drop of blood. No, obviously it's black and white, so yeah. there's no like red or anything. But there's you see a bit of blood circling down the um, down the drain, mm -hmm. but there's no stabbing there's no yeah. visible it's just Nor yeah. norma bates norma bates norma bates is, the mother, yeah norma. um just like swinging the knife and mm -hmm. gently screaming and uh yeah. and it, it's just incredible and yeah. baron herman's music as well mm -hmm. just uh, yeah a couple of interesting things about the shower scene just because i'm please full of, do i'm full please, of fun facts yes, about please, this film. please do so one mentioning bernard herman's music originally alfred hitchcock didn't want there to be any music over this scene okay he was basically just like right i wanted to, basically i just wanted to be silent i wanted to just be like screams and whatever i don't want any music and then when bernard Herrmann went away and scored the film and then came back and showed it to alfred hitchcock with the the score over it had to put in this there's like the sting of like the screeching yeah. violins with the knife you know you know you know you know, you know it, you know yeah. it. um basically showed, showed that to alfred hitchcock and then as soon as the scene was over just turns to him and is like right i know you said you didn't want any music and alfred hitchcock just went nope it's fine i was wrong we're good we're all good we're just we're doing this your your version is much better we're moving on what a relationship they must have i cannot imagine alfred hitchcock admitting he was wrong oh no god <laughs> oh, they yeah. must have had some relationship they must have had su <laughs> i mean they they worked together on a good few films good. vertigo and yeah. north by northwest Twist, uh, twisted nerves by this point I don't think Twisted Nerve was Hitchcock. Was it not? I don't think so. Oh, I thought it was. Maybe just because it's Bernard Herrmann, I assumed I think, that it yeah, was yeah. Hitchcock. Yeah, I don't think it was. Oh, possibly not then. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah, they had worked together on a few films. Yeah. Um, the other one is that a lot of people will praise the film. We talked about this a little bit in our second episode, talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. The way that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre manages to infer a lot yeah of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. visuals without actually showing anything this is a scene that gets credited with that 
a lot Mm -hmm. that like it does a really really good job of making you think that you're seeing like a naked woman getting stabbed but you don't see nudity well you don't see anything explicit no and you don't see at any point a knife going into skin you don't see any blood it's it's all just inferred with these like quick cuts and the screaming and the the violins it's yeah it's incredible it's so well done it really is yeah credit where credit's due i mean it's 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 this came out in 1960 Mm -hmm. and i'm trying to think of another like there's maybe other scenes in horror that i enjoy more or that I personally prefer, but it's hard to think, I d- definitely can't think of one off the top of my head, of another scene that's as iconic, that's yep. as well-renowned and kind of, yeah, I, I can't think of one. Yeah. I'm not even going to try. The, uh, the maybe, only, we'll think of one later. The only but. thing that even comes close, and maybe this is just popping into my head because of the very obvious connection is the bathtub scene in nightmare on elm street with the hand i wouldn't say that's as iconic probably not I may, i'm probably just making that connection because i'm like yeah. it's a bath and a it's shower a bath, yeah. but like um wet ladies and knives <laughs> wet ladies and knives yeah it's a good name for a band that oh yeah <laughs> the wet ladies that'd be a really good name for a band <laughs> um yeah, so we've got our protagonist is now been <laughs> just been marked w- well and that. chucked in a bog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well marked. Um, her car and her wrapped in a towel sh- in a shower curtain have been chucked in the bog by Norman. He 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 returns to the scene of the crime and he's sort of very shocked to see the murder and oh no, what's going on? He disposes of the body, obviously covering for his mother, or so we're supposed to think, mm-hmm. and he goes about his day. We then kind of cut back to Sam and Marion's sister, Lila. 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 Um, she's concerned about what's going on. She can't get a hold of Marion, doesn't know what's happening. Sam realizes he hasn't heard from her, doesn't know what's happening. They hire a PI to go and investigate. Mm-hmm. And he, he eventually ends up at Bates Motel as well. He tries to figure out what's going on. And um, after he kind of realizes there's something suspicious about Norman, he goes up to the house. There's a, there's the big the, Norman lives in a big house behind the hotel. You'll probably have seen that sh- that shot as well. Probably even what's inside this the yeah. big old sort of gothic. It's not a mansion, but like a yeah big big old house, big old country house yeah. um, with the porch and the basement underneath. And it's quite gothic looking. Very gothic looking. Uh, he goes up and goes to investigate. And there's this great scene of him walking in and kind of shouting up and what's going on and hello, is anyone home? And he walks up the stairs and it's obviously um, like not green screened, but, you know, uh, yeah, I guess what, whatever fake would... backdropped. I don't know what the term for it is. Yeah. He's kind of walking up the, the, the stairs as the camera is slowly kind of panning backwards and as he gets to the top of the stairs, there's this over the um, overhead shot of Norma Bates running out of the bedroom and stabbing him as he falls down the stairs. And then mm-hmm. he uh, there's a big dramatic fall Slash, slashes him <laughs> as he face. falls down the stairs. And then she runs down after him and stabs him to death. Mm-hmm. Um, and this scene, I remember seeing out of context very young. Really? I don't know how young I would have been, but I remember our dad watching Psycho. Yeah. And me seeing this scene of um, <laughs> Arbogast, the private investigator, Arbogast, sorry, yeah, sorry. Getting, getting murdered, and it terrified me. It's There's something really like visceral about the reaction you get when someone runs at you unexpectedly oh yeah especially in horror mm-hmm. so not runs at you but like within the context of the, the yeah, film yeah. you know someone running at another character just this very sudden quick movement like i'm not talking about a jump scare because a jump scare is very much like there's nothing and then there's something mm-hmm. when there's nothing and then something running until the jump scare there's something so much more terrifying about that. I don't know. I, I don't really know how to describe it. 
but I can think there's a couple of things I've got in my head. There's an episode of the X Files that does it. Mm-hmm. I know it's a really obscure reference. Yeah. It's not like a well known episode or anything, but I remember um there's a scene where Mulder is going into the house and he's investigating what's going on. Or I think it's he, he's he's kind of outside and then the woman inside the house is getting haunted by a evil demon or whatever. And the demon it doesn't run at her but just walks quickly out of one of the rooms and like down the corridor towards her and there's just something so so terrifying Mm -hmm. about not running but like just this very quick movement towards you yeah it It has a it has a purpose yeah yeah Yeah, a purposeful walk Uh and you know that purpose ain't good yeah (laughs) there's something just really really it just makes your stomach drop yeah there's something about it beyond a jump scare i think there's something about like if if a character is running or like sprinting there's that element of it being like a kind of crime of passion yeah whereas if someone's just sort of like walking quite quickly towards you it's like that it's it's more premeditated it's like calmer they don't yeah this isn't like a passionate thing they just know that they're gonna kill you i can see that being a lot scarier i I think that's what it would be for me at least yeah there's another one that i can think of which is maybe more of in the sort of running vein uh in get out which we have spoken about before there's the scene where chris goes outside he's having a cigarette outside and then the gardener it's not like a jump scare but he just he's just running at the camera at the camera right to what really and it's like lingers on him and he, as he's running towards him and as soon as he gets to chris he like turns off and runs away but it's that fear it's that kind of stomach dropping fear of just something coming towards you yeah um that just oh it makes you feel something Mm-hmm. I don't. I, I'm really bad at describing these things, but no, I don't. I don't. You know about. what I'm trying to I say? Like just this feeling of of yeah. yeah of fear, and that's what we get in this scene of just this yeah very purposeful, very quick walk out of the bedroom, overhead shot, stabbing the PI down the stairs, and that's him done. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. It's just brilliant. So PI gone, Marion gone. Yep. Um, Sam and Lila are forced to investigate themselves. So they go and they book a room at the at the Bates Motel. They they or or nearby. Sorry, they they book a room at another like B and B. No, they, the they book a room at the they book a room at the Bates. But they're Motel. staying elsewhere. They're staying. There's the older well, they're couple. Well, stay, they're staying in. No, the, that's the. It's like the sheriff and his wife. Oh, is it? The older couple is the sheriff and his wife. Yeah. Oh, why did I think they were staying? I don't know. Uh, oh, no, right. they stay okay. in the t- it's this town of Fairvale, which is like 10 miles away or something. All right. Which is where Sam lives. He's got his hardware store. So that's where Marion was heading at the start of the film. Okay. And she like there's a line quite early on when like she kind of says that she doesn't realize quite how close she was to Fairvale, but she's like, oh, I may as well stay the night anyway. And then, of course, that winds up getting her killed. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think they, they're just staying like in the hardware store where sam lives all right okay and then they go specifically to the motel to go and because i know yeah they do they do book a room they do yeah they go and book a to, room. to investigate but i don't know why i thought they then went back to like stay overnight maybe they just went to know. the sheriff's house yeah sorry i must have glossed over that bit never mind ignore me um so they're they stay the night and they're going to investigate they obviously figure out something's wrong with Norman and there's something weird with the, the old lady in the window of the house. Something's mm-hmm. not quite right. And then when they tell the sheriff and his wife about it, they realize that Norma's been dead for 20 years or <laughs> whatever. She's been dead for 10 years. Yeah. Oh. And we're like, oh, yeah. okay. What's going on then? It brings this whole thing that it's like, at that point, you don't know what's going on because it has this question of, is norman's mother really dead and this old woman that's living in the house is she somebody else yeah or is norman's mother not actually dead yeah and there's something really weird going on there yeah and it sort of it really brings this element of like at this point you do not know what is going on you do not know who this woman is for certain there is also a shot it's around about this time we see a shot of 
or we hear from outside the door Norman and his mum arguing. Mm -hmm. And then he says, like, no, the police are investigating. Someone's gone. We need to go down to the basement. And then we see him carrying his mother downstairs. So we know that there's someone there. There is a woman in the house. We know there's an old woman there. We assume that it's his mother by the way they're talking. So when the sheriff says she's been dead for 10 years, we're like, well, what? 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and obviously we know You're what the twist is. You're not putting me in the fruit cellar. But you like... think I'm fruity, huh? <laughs> I think that's really fun. I really like that line. I think it's funny. But it's so it's it's so masterfully done. It's like it, mm. I can imagine this at the time blowing people's minds. Oh, like yeah. what yeah, the hell is yeah. happening? Um, and we finally, you know, the last you know ten minutes, fifteen minutes of the film, they go back to the the motel to investigate uh, Sam. Uh, distracts Norman while Lila goes to investigate the house and as as Norman realizes something's going on he knocks out Sam and runs into the the building we follow Lila as she goes down into the basement and Mrs. Bates is sitting in the corner and she goes and she taps on the shoulder and this decrepit like disgusting corpse spins around and like faces her and screams well, she doesn't scream. Lila screams. Lila screams. But just the shot of like, oh my god, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's she's, a dead, she's dead body. She was dead the whole time. Um, and then yeah, Sam manages to catch Norman and subdue him mm-hmm. before he's able to kill Lila. He runs in with the the wig on and the he's knife. Got the wig and he's got a dress on over his clothes. And and he's got a knife in his hand. And we realise that yeah, something something fruity is going on. Yeah. <laughs> Norman was the psycho the whole time. Yeah. And then the last. He really was the psycho 1960. He was. Yeah. <laughs> the last 10 minutes of the film. It's actually quite a long sequence. I was surprised by how long it is. Yeah. There is quite a bit of an exposition dump at the end mm-hmm. with the psychiatrist explaining that Norman has like multiple personalities. He's been impersonating his mother and all this weird trauma and blah, blah, blah. But it ends on the wonderful shot of just this plain white wall and norman kind of sitting against it slowly zooming in on his face with the voiceover of him like talking to his mother in his head it's it's wonderful yeah it, and it's, it is a great ending it's a really just great scene slow burn him not explaining but just us understanding just how insane he is mm. it's yeah it's wonderful yeah and that's it. And that's the end of the film. That's the end of the film. Yeah. Yeah. I it, love this film so it's much, something. man. I love this film so much. Yeah. What, do you, gr- what do you think? Do you want to give your opinion first? Yeah, I I, I loved it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was, yeah, really impressed by it. I, I'm i always kind of skeptical going back to these old films because I am very much... Uh, I my attention span is not great. Mm -hmm. So when I watch these older films that are very much a slow burn and their acting isn't, you know, great and there's lots of long shots, my attention does drift. Um, So I was worried watching this film that that would be one of those films that I just kind of can't really appreciate it. But no, I loved it. I thought it was great. I, I was just captivated by um Anthony Perkins I thought he was just wonderful he throughout he's, he does such an amazing job the supporting I, I Janet Lee's not really supporting but Janet Lee's performance I thought was amazing yeah the PI yes Aber, Abergast Ar- Arbogast Arbogast I would need to was yeah. amazing as well I would need to double check the actor that played Arbogast the, he's a fairly well-known actor um right. I I can't can't remember his name but yeah, him, him and uh, Anthony Perkins, when they're up against each other in the motel, it's just such a great scene. It's just the scene when they're having when, they're having dinner, and well, he's sort of interrogating him. So, so, well, as a PI. Oh no, sorry, him. no, no, yeah, yeah, sorry, Arbogast, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arbogast, yeah, yeah, is just brilliant. It's mm-hmm. just so like it's just so tense, like, it is. and uh, yeah, I thought I thought Sam and Lila, unfortunately, were not quite up to par with the rest of them hmm. but i guess their plots are kind of secondary to the first two that being uh marion and i guess yeah i guess yeah um, um yeah 
We've got Vera Miles as Lila Crane and John yeah. Gavin as Sam Loomis. We didn't Sam mention Loom- that that's oh, his, his name. name Loomis. His name's Loomis. That's who Sam, Sam Loomis from Halloween him. is named after. I didn't realize that. Um, um, yeah, yeah, it was Martin Balsam was the name of the actor that plays Arbogast. Right. I mean, they're de- they're definitely not bad. Yeah, no, 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 they're definitely not bad. It's just the other actors, I think, I think were, were did a better job. I think they did well, yeah. Um, and of course, it's it's Hitchcock. It's wonderfully directed. All these beautiful shots, even in black and white. I mean, the film yeah. is, is amazing. Mm-hmm. It looks amazing. Um, and... It was an intentional choice to do it in black and white. Was it? Yeah. I mean, this was after, like, this oh, was so after, Peeping was, Tom was color. Was so Peeping was... Tom, but I mean, this was after like Vertigo. This was after Rear Window. Like, oh, even yeah. Hitchcock had done a bunch of films in color. Oh. He intentionally chose to do it in black and white, like stylistically. It works. Um, and it, it absolutely works. works. And he, it had a really low budget. It was like under a million. He worked with the. It was actually like a TV crew rather than a film crew that he worked with. It right. was the crew that did Alfred Hitchcock Presents. That he went and did it with. And yeah, they just they do such a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, it's it's it, it's great. It's you know even if you know the entire plot, which I did, it, it's still enjoyable. Yeah, it's still enjoyable, and it's still interesting to see how it all plays out. Um, if I have to find fault in it, I I, I would say the Sam and Lila little bit weak. Mm-hmm. in terms of their characters i think the other ones are far more interesting yeah um and that big 10 minute exposition dump at the end bugs me a little bit yeah uh so i couldn't give it a full perfect score mm-hmm. but i gave it four and a half out that of five is uh, absolutely justified I, I, i'm really I, if you had turned around and said that you hate this film i would have stopped the podcast right now no I wouldn't it, have done it anymore. I, I i was worried that i would honestly yeah. i was worried that i would because it's really it, it's not these older films are not really my jam like I can appreciate them from afar and what they've done for horror, but generally watching them, I'll choose something newer. Yeah. Um, but they, I mean, yeah, I completely understand why this is so well renowned. Mm-hmm. Like it was just incredible. Yeah. I I absolutely adore this. Yeah. This is honestly this is one of my favorite films it ever is. made. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, I think the stuff with Sam and Lila, I do agree with you. I think the reason that I don't dislike it as much is maybe because i'm coming with the context of having read the book that this is based on right um that robert block wrote not long before i think it, he only, it was 59 I, I, think. I think he only finished writing it in 59 yeah or like it only got published in 59 um there's a like there's a little bit more there's a little bit more depth to the character of Sam, at least, because there's a whole thing. We get a little bit of it at the beginning of the film with Sam and Marion being together, but Marion can't run... They can't get married because Sam has a lot of debt because his dad owned this hardware store that he's inherited, but he also inherited all of his dad's debt. So he needs to pay all of that off before he can afford to like buy a house Perfect. and move somewhere else and kind of start living his life property, properly. And he doesn't want to bring Marion into that and have this whole thing. And we don't really get it in the film or we get little hints of it. And I think knowing that context makes it feel a little bit deeper and a mm-hmm. little bit richer. I can understand why, like, if you don't have that, you would see the characters as being not particularly interesting. I think Lila, I guess you kind of get that. The only thing you really get from Lila, the only kind of more context that you get from the book is just this sort of she's not really like her sister and her and sam get along really well because they both like classical music Mm. is like something that comes up in the book is that like she kind of looks down on sam because he just sort of runs a hardware store and she's very cultured i think she runs a she runs a music shop i think lila it doesn't come up in the film but like there's a whole thing that like they sort of bond over they actually have a lot in common Uh and this whole thing so it's sort of i guess you sort of infer a lot of that onto the film I mean... That's not really explored. Yes and no. I mean, I kind of got that. When they, when they first meet, when Lila first comes to Sam, there's very much this clash of, she's my sister, what have you done with her? I want to know what's going on. Yeah. And then as they start to investigate and as they spend time together, particularly when they go and see the sheriff and stuff, mm-hmm. there's very much this sort of um, common cause yeah. that they bond over. And yeah. okay, they don't. It, there's not that subplot with like classical music or whatever. Yeah. But I kind of did get that in the brief. I mean, they're not in the film. They're only in the film the last half of the the movie. Yeah. Um, 
but I did definitely get that that they kind of bonded, and then when he saves her at the end from Norman, yeah, there is this element of like they've you know they have gotten closer over the the course of the film. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know. It maybe it does go deeper in the book, but yeah. I, I didn't disagree that it was. We'll we'll need to watch yeah. Cycle Two at some point. Will we? I might. Will we? It, people, you know what? It won. There was like a. <laughs> There was an interview in um, Eli Roth's History of Horror mm -hmm. with Tom Holland, who directed uh, Psycho 2. Yeah. And he starts talking about how there's this, like, underground, like, secret... Not, like, secret society. Like, I'm exaggerating a little <laughs> like bit. Like the Freemasons. But there's, like, this, like, secret society of, like, horror industry professionals, and they host some big dinner or whatever, and apparently at one point they hosted a big dinner and they decided like unanimously that the best horror sequel ever made is psycho 2 really apparently although that was tom holland that said that so i don't know um lots of people stand by it lots of people think it's great i really want to give it a watch um but yeah i think because um vera miles comes back as lila uh -huh. and i think at that point they elaborate that her and sam actually wind up together right after the events of the first film Okay. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, um, yeah. So I can see where you're coming from with that. I don't necessarily care about it that much. Again, the end of the film. Th this is one of the things that a lot of people criticize of the film for is this ending that's very slow, and ju they ju kind of just dump a bunch of information. They're suddenly like, "Here's a psychiatrist who's going to have a monologue for five yeah. minutes where he talks about everything that's wrong with Norman and explains the plot in detail," and it's unnecessary and a little frustrating um for a long time a lot of people blamed alfred hitchcock or people do tend to blame alfred hitchcock for that and i don't think that alfred hitchcock does a very good job of ending films i really hate the end of vertigo for example um i really hate the end of uh, north by northwest as well okay i like don't think that alfred hitchcock does a very good job of ending films but he's not to blame for the end of Psycho because the end of the book is the exact is same. Okay. There's a solid chapter at the end of the film that's just like a monologue of a psychiatrist explaining it. the plot so okay. far. And it's kind of frustrating. Um, yeah, so I don't particularly like that, but also I can look past it because I love the film so much. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, you've got great performances by Janet Lee. Anthony Perkins just absolutely knocks it out of the park. He is fantastic the whole way through yeah he gives such an amazing performance even the supporting cast like you say like john gavin veer miles are fine they're not amazing i think martin balsam as arbogast is really good i think even down to like some of the really minor characters like um pat hitchcock alfred hitchcock's daughter plays the other secretary in the all right the at, at the start That's like, right. yeah, yeah. like janet lee's co-worker I think she does a really good job. I think she's just like, she's, yeah, and like the other fine. characters, like the guy that runs the office and this really rich guy that the rich Texan, the rich Texan that, yeah, he is. He's the yeah, character he's, from the Simpsons. Yeah. He shoots the revolvers in the air and everything. Um, he comes in and I think he just gives a good performance. He's a minor character, but he just does such a, he does a good <laughs> job. He I think do, he does yeah. a good job. Um, and yeah, visually and, and the soundtrack and the, just the plot is just, Ugh, everything about it i absolutely love this is a five out of five for me five out of five this is a this is Good. this is about as close to perfect as any horror film can be in that's my fair. opinion or that's any fair. film at all yeah i love it i'm glad I yeah love it. i can't fault you on any of that i think i was just maybe a little bit harsh because yeah there was like i wouldn't consider it a perfect film so no no i i, I don't think there's such a thing as as a perfect well film. yeah okay fair but. um uh, but i think there's not there's basically nothing about it i would change okay i think the only things that i would potentially change about the film are things that are also present in the book and therefore i'm not faulting the film yeah that's... so i'm giving it a perfect five yeah okay that's fair that's fair yeah i'm glad and yeah it, what what a way to kick off the slasher genre yeah oh absolutely i mean yeah both these films to be fair both people i think and they, psycho i think you know they're both really great in their own right they're very yeah. very different they are but also very similar they make such an interesting double bill uh, it's uh, yeah because yeah they, there are huge differences even like peeping tom is so vibrant and colorful mm -hmm. 
and Psycho makes the choice to be in black and white. And like, you've got the two main characters are really quite similar. Like Mark Lewis and Norman Bates are both these sort of like, they're twisted and they're weird, but they're also really sort of sympathetic and affable. And mm-hmm. they have this weird kind of neurotic charm that you, you can't help but just like, you your heart bleeds for them a little bit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. I think they, I think they make a really interesting double bill. Absolutely. You could see them on a DVD together. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, yeah do let us know if you decide to do a, a double bill of mm. peeping tom and psycho let us know what you think how they compare yeah what which one's better it's psycho i think psycho's a bit better i think <laughs> i think they're both pretty great but i think psycho i think psycho weeks it out yeah i think so too good well there is proto slashers mm-hmm. we can now move on to actual slashers yeah we can that's the prequel and then we move on to <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, but no, 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 not quite slashers yet. We have a great one for you next week, ladies and gentlemen. A great white one. A great, a great white one. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. You alluded to it earlier on. I did. We have plugged our list of themes into the into the wheel, the wheel of <laughs> the wheel of themes. Wheel of themes. Give it a good spin, mm-hmm. and we have cracked out sharks as next week's theme. <laughs> oh boy. Which is is funny because I mean you think of shark you think of like shark horror films and you immediately think of Jaws but then there's so many other ones there are so many um there is there's one Deep good Blue shark sea, horror film Great and it's White, Jaws <laughs> Jaws yeah. you know Sharknado um <laughs> Sharknado 5 Global Swarming Oh my god um House Shark please, no <laughs> we do not speak of House Shark um yeah, so right. <laughs> I I very much have gone well, let's see what you've got first. Okay. Just in case we've picked the same thing. Because you've got, got a backup. Because you've got a couple. Um yeah, you've got a couple, so you're letting me go first. I oh I, it's so We have to <sighs> lean into it. We, we have, have to, to lean, lean into, into it. Okay, cool. Cause, so we're not picking Jaws because Jaws is the one good horror yeah, film about a shark. It's no fun so to talk about not, that. And that'll come, that'll come up in another theme. We'll, sure. cover, we'll cover Jaws at some point. I think it's too on the nose to talk about yeah. sharks. Um, I'm going to go with Deep Blue Sea. Okay. Okay. It's, it, I basically know nothing about it other than it's got Samuel L. Jackson in it. Have you not seen it it's before? Like, I've not seen it before. Okay. It's like an action horror, right? It's action horror, yeah. It's late 90s, uh, I think. Yeah, 90, mid-90s. 90, 90, yeah, something. Yeah. Um, Samuel L. Jackson. I, I, it's got other famous people in it, doesn't it? It do, I can't Does it not have... It is, is it Ice Cube that's in it? No. Who is it? Maybe. It's some. It's someone who's also a rapper is in it, I'm sure. This was around the time when there were loads of because this was like this would have been between Halloween H twenty and Halloween Resurrection. So this is like L- Rhymes. LL Cool J, Buster Rhymes, <laughs> uh, who is in Deep Blue Sea. I'm gonna look it up real quick. Um, Method Man, Method Man. What was Method Man in? I I don't know. He's in loads of stuff. You've got Red Man was in Bride of Chucky. That was around this time as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, oh God, it? Thomas Jane. Samuel L. Jackson, the Punisher, Michael Rappaport. Oh God, Stellan Skarsgård. It's LL Cool J. It is LL Cool J. It's LL okay. Cool J. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to looking forward to Deep Blue Sea. I, I, I have to say, what I remember of this film, I'm pretty sure I watched it at a sleepover when I was like 12. Mm-hmm. I remember it not being like so bad. It's good. Just being bad okay <laughs> so i'm curious to see if my opinion on that has changed cool meanwhile mm-hmm. i have decided to lean right into the bad i'm going for the schlockiest that i can find very excited jaws the revenge jaws the revenge which one is that is that the third one jaws the 4 one? with sir with michael, michael Caine. oh yes <laughs> and there is the famous quote <laughs> when he was asked what he thought of the film and he says i haven't seen the film but i have seen the house that it bought my mother and it's lovely <laughs> i love michael caine so much i am um, i I'm, I'm watching it for him i gotta know yeah. i gotta know yeah. because famously you know jaws is you know a 10 out of 10 film yeah a five out of five film if we're going by our rating system yeah um 
and famously, the rest of the Jaws sequels are just absolute garbage. Just absolute trash. But I've never seen any of the sequels. No, neither so have I. So I, I, I'm curious. Let's we go for the wa- worst one. Let's them. figure out how bad they actually are. I'm oh, diving right in. Yeah. Diving can, right in. Diving right in. Yeah. We got to do... Um, I think we've got to do 3D films at I some point did... as a theme. 3D films would be fun because then we can do Jaws 3. And Piranha 3D. And Piranha 3D. And that's another oceanic adventure. And us. yeah, basically any time a film reaches the third installment, they start doing stuff in 3D because there was also Amityville 3. There was Friday the 13th 3. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh God, I forgot about Friday the 13th. <laughs> Friday the 13th part 3. Oh, there was... Not not a third film in the franchise, but Nightmare on Elm Street Six has it is did it, 3D? it does three D at the end. There's 3D a bit, is such they a go into weird the, gimmick, like man. dreamscape and they do all the three D stuff for it, the last uh, like ten minutes. Yeah, okay. That that's a good theme. I think we 3D. need to do that. Add that we'll add that 3D. to the backlog. Add it to see the if it comes up. Stick it on the wheel. Stick it on the wheel. Yes, we will. <laughs> okay, that's our theme for next week. Sharks. Yep. This week was Proto Slashers. Mm-hmm. We hope you have a fantastic week. Yeah. And we will see you next time where we hit the high seas. <laughs> the high seas? That's like pirates. I guess. We hit the, the deep seas. The bays. The bays. Oh, the, the bays. The the reefs. Yeah. That's the, more ominous. <laughs> the Yeah. Yeah. Robert Shaw. <laughs> he's not in this. He died in the first one. Yeah, <laughs> he's 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 not kicking about. Cool. Thank you all for listening. It's been a pleasure having you. We will see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>